Welcome to our Bible study. If you'll open to Mark chapter 6, we're going to be looking at a passage of Scripture that if you're a Bible student, it's a familiar passage. It's called the feeding of the 5,000, but there's so much in this passage of Scripture. If we were to examine the entire chapter 6, uh, we'll see this is the chapter where Jesus commissions the apostles. Now, when we use the word apostles, the, the word apostle literally means one sent out on a mission. A missionary, if you will. Now, these are the original 12. Jesus commissions them. And in verse number 13, or verse number 12, it says, So they went out, and they preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons, anointed many sick people with oil, and healed them. Then there is a break in this chapter where Mark talks about John the Baptist and his death. In verse number 30, it picks up really where it left off in verse number 13. So if we were to, to, to relook at this chapter in a different way, we might just say chapter th or verse number 13, and then you jump to verse number 30. This, this, this section in between is almost a parenthesis. So Jesus has commissioned his apostles. They've gone out. They've preached the message of repentance. They have been given the ability to, to uh, pray over people, to heal people, to anoint people. Uh, they had the ability to drive out demons that possess people. So verse number 30, it says, The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. So they came back together after going out to all these surrounding villages and areas and, and, and preaching. They came back together and, if you will, they, they kind of had just a reporting time of what had taken place. Jesus said to them, Come away by yourselves to a remote place and rest for a while. For many people were coming and going and they did not even have time to eat. We've already talked about all the people that were pressing around Jesus and uh, how people were coming to him because of all of the miracles he had performed. But the same had been true now with the apostles. They had gone out and they were apparently tired after coming back in and reporting. And Jesus said, Let, let's, let's get away. Let's have a little retreat. We need to rest. Rest is a biblical thing. You know, the body, or excuse me, the Bible tells us that we need rest for our body, we need rest for our soul, we need rest for our spirit. In, in Matthew, chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 11, Jesus says, Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Jesus can give us rest for our spirit and our soul. But our body also needs rest as well. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 is that familiar passage of Scripture where Solomon says to everything there's a season, a time to every purpose under the heavens. And he talks about these, these times or seasons of life. Now, he doesn't specifically mention these two, but, uh, but in these, this list of seasons or times, there is also this impression there are times to work, there are times to rest. Jesus calls, or, or excuse me, Solomon uses it this way. There is a time to gather stones. In other words, there is a time to, to, uh, to work. And so Jesus said, you guys have been out. You're tired. You're, you, you, you've given yourself. You need to retreat, if, if you will. We need a time of rest. So what did they do? They went away by boat. Now, they were in Capernaum on the north end of the Sea of Galilee. There were a lot of little villages around that area. And if they had walked to a, to a place, people would have just followed them. So they got in this boat and they took off. But now the Sea of Galilee, as our pastor talks, tells us often, it's not really a sea. It's a misnomer. It's a lake. You can see across this lake, and particularly on the north end, uh, it's easy to see boats out there. 
Well, people were so enamored with Jesus that they watched the boat and they just followed along the shore. And so as they followed along the shore, in verse number 32, it says, So they went away in a boat by themselves to a remote place. But many saw them leaving and recognized them, and they ran on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. So what they had planned really didn't happen. People followed them around. But look at the response of Jesus. When he went ashore, Jesus went ashore, he saw the large crowd and had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. Underline or circle the word compassion. Keep in mind, Jesus got in the boat with the disciples to retreat, to rest, to get away from the work for a little while. But the people saw him and they followed along the shore and they, they wound up where Jesus was. You know, I, I have to ask myself, what would be my response? Honestly, I would probably be irritated. I would be annoyed at this because what I had planned had all failed. It hadn't come to, to, to reality. Jesus did not respond that way. You see, Jesus was people-focused. All of his ministry, he was focused on people. And when he saw the people, the scripture says he had compassion on them. Well, why was it he had compassion on them? Because he was able to look into them and to see some things that maybe we fail to see. Oftentimes, we look at people's actions and we make assumptions based on their actions. But Jesus had compassion on them because the Bible says he saw them as sheep that had no shepherd. It reminds me of the 23rd Psalm. It talks about the Lord is our shepherd. But listen to some of these things that a shepherd does. The Lord is my shepherd. I have what I need. Well, I have what I need because the shepherd is the provider of those things. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He, he gives us a time of peace. He leads me beside still waters. He restores or he renews my life. He leads us along the right paths for His namesake. He guides us day by day where we need to go. And even though there are times when it says we go through the darkest valleys of life, the shepherd is there with us to comfort us, to provide for us. We, we could go on, and, and certainly uh, that's a, a very quick synopsis of what a shepherd does. But Jesus said, these people, they don't have that. They don't have someone to lead them in the way they're to go. They're not, they don't have someone to give them the peace that they're desiring in life. They don't have someone to provide for them the things that they need. And because of that, Jesus had compassion on them. This is convicting to me. Because oftentimes I see people through my eyes of flesh rather than through the lens of the Holy Spirit. I see people's actions and I condemn them. When perhaps, yes, their actions are not right, but I should have pity on them. I should have compassion on them. We cannot expect an unsaved person to act like one that's redeemed. We cannot expect one that does not have the Holy Spirit to act like one that does have the Holy Spirit to guide them. Do we truly have compassion on people without Jesus? That's what he did. Verse 35, 
It's, it, it says it grew late. Now, it grew late because Jesus was teaching them. Jesus was trying to get away so he could rest, but instead, as the people gathered around, he had compassion on them. He began to teach them. He taught them the Word of God. He taught them things about himself. So Jesus taught them, and as the day began to close, his disciples approached him and, and, and just brought up this, uh, uh, this, this reality. He says, look, we, we've retreated here because there's nothing around here. They didn't retreat to a town. They retreated to a deserted place to get away from people. But the people came to that deserted place and said, look, there, there's nothing around here. It's time for these people. They're going to get hungry. It's time for us to eat before we call it a day. So don't you think we need to call this a close and let them leave, let them go away to the villages and to the communities around us here and they can find something to eat? But look at Jesus' response. You give them something to eat. That was an impossible directive. The scripture says there were 5,000 men. And the, the, the word men, down in verse 44, uh, it, it's talking about adult men. So how many people were there? Well, it could have very well been fifteen to 20,000 people. How are we supposed to feed 15,000 people? It's impossible. Jesus gave them an impossible task to do. This miracle is the only miracle recorded in all four of the Gospels. And if you take all four of the Gospels and you read all four of them, you, you, you get the picture of what really took place. The Scripture says Jesus knew what He was going to do. So when He told them, let's feed them, Jesus already knew. He, he instructs them next to, to go look and to see what's out there that they could feed them. Uh, the, the apostles responded, look, it's going to take six months' wages at least to feed this crowd. He, they talk about 200 denarii. Denarii was a daily wage for an agricultural employee. 200 wages, that's more than six months of the year. So, so Lord... We're going to, it's going to take six months' wages to feed all these people. So Jesus says, well, go see what food's out there. So in verse number 38, he asked him, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. When they found out, they said, five and two fish. Um, another one of the Gospels, I believe it's John, tells us that these belong to a boy. A young boy. He had these five loaves and two fish. Verse 39. Then Jesus instructed the apostles to have all the people sit down in groups on green grass. So they sat down in groups of fifties and hundreds. And then Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish and looking up into heaven, he blessed and broke the loaves. There is uh, a great illustration for us that before, uh, before they ate, Jesus gave a blessing. He thanked the Lord for that food. I'm glad that my parents taught me and taught my sisters uh, that biblical truth. From the earliest of my life, I can remember always saying the blessing before we ate. Well, what's the blessing? The blessing is just acknowledging the food that we need comes from God and thanking God for it. In verse number 41, it says, Jesus blessed this food. He broke the loaves. In other words, he tore them apart. 
And he kept giving them to the disciples to set before the people. You might want to underline or circle the words, kept giving. Here's a miracle in and of itself. Jesus would tear off some bread and tear off some bread and tear off some bread and tear off some bread. And he just had more to tear off. He just kept breaking more and more and more off and distributing it. And it was an ongoing. He also divided the two fish among them. Verse 42. Everyone ate and was satisfied. Everyone ate and was satisfied. John put it this way. They ate as much as they wanted. I believe if someone wanted seconds, they got seconds. Someone wanted thirds, they got thirds. They ate as much as they wanted till they were full. Verse 43, they picked up 12 baskets full of pieces of bread and fish. Now those who had eaten the loaves were 5,000 men. When Don and I go to restaurants uh, on occasions, uh, we don't eat everything. And oftentimes we'll say, do you have a to-go box? And we'll get that to-go box and uh, we'll put those leftover food, that leftover food in the to-go box and we'll take it and that will be a meal for us in the next day or two. We call them leftovers at our house. We have leftovers. Leftover for another meal. Out of five loaves and two little fish, there were 12 baskets full of leftovers after 15,000 people had eaten all they wanted until they were stuffed full. Interesting 12, isn't it? How many apostles were there? There were 12. Now those who had eaten the loaves were about 5,000 men. Let me give you a few truths from this as we conclude. First of all, if we think about the boy that had the food, he gave what he had. He gave what he had. It didn't seem like much, but he gave it to Jesus. And Jesus took it and used it to bless 15 to 20,000 people. The same is true today. We may say, what do we have to give? I can't do this. I don't have this talent. I don't have this ability. But what do we have? Jesus can take what you have and multiply it to impact so many people. The mission of our church is connecting every generation to God, others, and service. You know what service is? Service is giving what you have to God. Now think about that. Service is giving what you have to God. Perhaps you have uh, a personality that you'd be a great door greeter on Sunday mornings. And you think, well, what, 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 what impact does that have? Let me tell you, your smile on a Sunday morning and a warm greeting and a handshake, maybe a hug, a kind word, it may be the first kind word that person's heard in days. It may make their whole week. It may make their experience at church that day real because of just that greeting. Maybe uh, your desire is to be behind the scenes. It's to wash dishes at one of our, uh, one of our meals that we have. God blesses that. God can use that. Every person in our church using their gifts of service, think about the multiplication.
that God will accomplish to impact the lives of so many. There's a song from several years ago that I remember called Little Is Much When God Is In It. The first verse says, In the harvest field now ripened, there's a work for all to do. Hark, the voice of God is calling to the harvest, calling you. Listen to the chorus. Little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you go in Jesus' name. Does the place you're called to labor seem so small and little known? It is great if God is in it and he'll not forget his own. When our conflict here is ended and our race on earth is run, he will say if we are faithful, welcome home, child, well done. Little is much if God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you go in Jesus' name. Give what you have to Jesus. But there's another truth I want us to remember as we close. The disciples were concerned because the people had nothing to eat. And Jesus said, give them something to eat. And their response is, we, it would take six months wages to do that. How in the world is this going to happen? Do you remember just the day or two before what the disciples, the, the apostles were doing? They were casting out demons. They were healing people of disease and sickness. They were performing miracles. And they had already forgotten that they were serving a miracle performing God. You see, oftentimes our lives have parameters or guardrails built into them of the things that we have experienced and we've known and nothing beyond that. May we ask God to take off the blinders on our eyes, take away the guardrails of our own experience and have faith that God can accomplish far more than what we can ever imagine or think because we serve and we're children of a miracle performing God. If He can perform the miracle of taking away all of your sin and giving you His Spirit to live within you and giving you life eternal and giving you the adoption as His own child, oh, God can do anything in and through us if we'll only have the faith to believe. Have the faith that God can take what you give to Him, even little things, that God can take those and can make them mountains of blessings for other people. What a lesson we have today. Our Father, we thank You for Your love for us. You have called us to Yourself through Jesus Christ. You have made us Your children. You have blessed us. But You have also commissioned us to go into your name and, Lord, to take the gospel so that others will see and know Jesus. Lord, may we take that which we have, as little as it may be, place it at your feet and allow you to do something great with it. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Have a blessed day.